No my hi my hui hui my name Tina Ko Papa Ko and Private Chopper Angawa Ko G Regional Strategies and Sectors Kitipuna Omanga Venture Tadanaki Tokumahu. Not a tena tato tato. Just like to really welcome you all here today to the Branching Out event focusing on high value medicinal herbs. My name is Anne Probert, I'm from Venture Tadanaki, and we're really pleased to be hosting this session tonight in conjunction with the Stratford Herb Society, who are the, the Tadanaki branch of the Herb Federation of New Zealand. Big welcome to everyone here in the room and also the many people who have um, hooked in online tonight. So really great to have so many um, people interested. And I think that speaks to the, the, the keenness of the topic, its potential, the caliber of the speakers that we have tonight and some of the work streams underway. So um, we're set for a, a, a good session. But we, before we start, it would be just like to if I can get the technology with it. We would like to commence with a katakia. We would like to commence with um, a katakia, and um, this is one which we often use at Venture Taranaki, but please feel free to join in with us, but if um, the um, Fiji Karanaki, the Tupuna Umanga team could um, stand and join with me for this, that would be, um, that would be appreciated. Karani Kaurani nui e tu e honei, ko papa tuanuku e takatu aki nei. Adahina ma matou, e roto, e ro kurua, kurua ara. Moa aki tonu, tihei, mori ara. Just to provide, especially for the people in the room here tonight, some quick um, housekeeping matters and health and safety. So firstly, firstly with our... Uh, if you're not eating or drinking. In terms of um, other, other items, fire exits, should one, the unlikely event of one arise, there are some clearly marked exits um, out of these stores, and we congregate out of those stores in the back here um, is where, the, where we come together should such an emergency arise. In the event of an earthquake, just go somewhere, somewhere sturdy. I think the golden rule is duck, cover, and hold. Um, in the event, uh, if you wish to use the toilets, you go down the stairs that you came up from, and you take a sharp right and you'll find them down there. And finally, finishing time tonight, we've got a lot to get through, but aiming to finish tonight at, at seven o'clock. So thank you for that. So before we do our deep dive into medicinal herbs, I just wanted to give a very quick frame and context for the event tonight and how this has come about. So firstly, we live in a time of, of change. There is, as we mentioned, COVID, but there's also um, climate change moving towards a low emission economy. There's technological change, there's social change, political change. And um, also in terms of just the way we, we live and work and the things that we, we eat and, and trends are all changing. So thinking ahead, it's in uncertain times, which brings challenges, but also brings us immense opportunities. <laughs> but one of the things that we can do, that we had a eureka moment, one of the things that we can really do, and it makes a great deal of difference, is to have a plan. So planning can make a difference in a time of change, and it's a way to front foot some of those areas of opportunity, whether it's for ourselves or our future generations. And these, we do have a plan for the region in the form of the Taranaki 2050 roadmap, which is also informed by the um, Make Way for Taranaki Tapua Plan as well. 
And the vision of this plan is to have a high value, low emissions um, economy, which has some really important underpinning pillars such as inclusivity and sustainability. And drilling down even further within that plan, there's a really um, key area in the food and fibre section. And we're really blessed here in Taranaki. We have this wonderful province. We can have, uh, we've got a climate and soils that make us capable of growing great things. We have strong food production um, economy here, entrepreneurial people, and there are um, some real opportunities in this area moving forward. There's untapped, untapped potential. In terms of looking at what that potential may look like, the branching out project drills down on what some innovative commercially viable opportunities within this area are. And if you can see the small print in there, it talks about we're actually going to identify 10 to 12 feasible high value potential ventures and develop group blueprints around those. So some of those areas that we're looking at within the branching out project are areas such as kiwi fruit, which we've started looking at, trees in their value chain, avocados, hemp fibre, and we're down to number five, which is looking at high value medicinal plants, particularly in the um, non-Indigenous area. So that's, I guess, gives a bit of a frame for the opportunities that we're starting to look at here in the region. So tonight, the, the focus is all about number five, the high value medicinal plants. Just a quick plug for the people behind the project. We are we're the deliverers, but we know there's heaps of partners working with us on this project. All of the councils are funding these, this program in Taranaki, the government through MPI, um, and a whole range of the, the, the CRIs, the Crown Research Institutes. Massey University has been a big supporter and really appreciate their input and a range of private sector and other people giving a lot of in-kind help and assistance with this. So that just gives you a quick frame for um, why the, the framework for tonight and the branching out project and the, and the reason for drilling down on the topic matter tonight. But now I'd like to hand you over to Michelle Bauer. And Michelle is the project manager for branching out. She is going to be the MC for tonight and also take you through the program um, as it lays out. So Michelle, over to you. Thank you. Kia ora koutou. as Anne just introduced me, my name is Michelle Bauer and I'm the project manager for Branching Out at Venture Taranaki. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us to further explore medicinal plants as a high potential commercial opportunity for our region. Today is the culmination of an activity that has been extremely exciting and to think it all started with a stuff article called Grow Weeds, Make Millions, um, we hopefully are well on track. Um, the activity has, um, has truly been a collaborative exercise, so between Venture Taranaki, the Stratford Herb Society and our community. Over 30 local growers um, have participated with more to come, and we've also attracted 150 registrations for this evening, with some people attending um, obviously in person, um, as well as via Zoom, and this is really um, individuals from across the value chain. So um, we've got landowners, we've got interested growers, we've got people who have got aspirations to, um, to launch a consumer product, um, as well as potential investors. And I'd like to welcome you all. The support and interest in medicinal plants as a commercial opportunity has really reinforced our region's capabilities. So not only do we have a land and climate that's suitable to support a large variety of high potential crops, but we also have skills and knowledge in the region, and really importantly, a willingness to share this to enable the industry to develop. We have considerable strength in food production and processing sectors with capabilities and experiences that can be applied to this industry, and we've experienced that there really is a readiness to do this. And finally, most importantly, there's a collective belief across the value chain that Taranaki is well positioned for a thriving medicinal plants industry. Our objective tonight is to present an overview of the opportunity from a variety of perspectives. It's to provide an understanding of what is in, needed to enable a thriving Taranaki medicinal plants industry. It's to facilitate the sharing of information and formation of connections to support the commercialization of this opportunity. And it is to inspire action. 
So we have a fantastic lineup of speakers today, um, all of whom are experts in their field. And we're also going to be launching a new platform for collaboration around this exciting activity. So I really encourage you to make the most of the question and answer se session. So if you're joining us via Zoom, um, please enter your questions in the chat box and our moderator, Conrad, um, will pick these up and ask them on your behalf. So without further ado, I would like to invite Shona Hopkirk up. So Shona needs no introduction to many of you as she's the president of the Stratford Herb Society, um, which is one of many hats that she wears. So Shona has been integral to this project and has worked tirelessly to connect us with her network of growers and to share information. So I'd really like to take this opportunity to thank her. She has a great vision for the industry and we'll take you through this in more detail. Well, welcome everybody, it's so wonderful to see such a good turnout and I know there are so many people online as well. Um, I apologize if I'm going to duplicate a little bit of information that has already been said tonight, uh, but I've been offered the opportunity just to talk a little bit about our view of this project and what we'd like to see, and also just to introduce the, um, our Herb Society and Herb Federation. All right. I'd like for that one. Okay, um, as Michelle said, um, and I'm Shona, I'm the president of the Stratford Herb Society, which is currently the only one operating in, officially in Taranaki, um, and also vice president for the North Island of the Herb Federation. Uh, I'm just a, a person that loves using herbs, growing herbs, and continuing to expand my knowledge of herbs and encouraging other people to do the same thing. Medicinal herbs is one aspect of this project um, that's been undertaken by Venture Taranaki, and they're working extensively with the community um, and with the various contacts I've had, with the uh, response from media reports, etc. cetera. Um, it's wonderful to get so much feedback there. They are um, promoting a diverse food and fiber industry and very pleased to see medicinal herbs take, taking a um, priority in there. There is a real need for locally grown quality herbs. A large proportion of the herbs that is used in the industry are imported because although many of us grow many herbs, we're lacking the infrastructure to make an industry of it. Uh, many herbalists grow their own herbs for their own use. Um, there are suppliers to some, some of the big producers, but the majority of them are, are um, imported. And I think we could do something to change that. Okay, just to look briefly, just at a couple of examples um, of some of the herbs that are very common and it's the majority of people that responded to our survey grew calendula. But we don't do anything with it apart from for our own use. So, you know, there was the opportunity for herbs like calendula. If you've got a spare paddock and wanted to grow a, um, a paddock of calendula, um, Elder is another common one. It grows as a reed in parts of the country, but very few people do anything with it. Um, I'm not sure if anybody does anything with it commercially. I wasn't able to find any information on that. Um, the elderflower, the elderberry are both ex very important um, medicinal herbs. And I'd like to see us again do something with these. Instead of considering it as a reed, let's consider it as a important uh, component of our medicinal herbs project. As I said, I see um, the opportunity for the people to grow this. My view of it is like a co-op where somebody could have a couple of paddocks, Somebody could just have some spare space in their herb garden. 
you can grow um, elder, echinacea, calendula in bulk, or you can go for one of the niche herbs that are also required, but don't necessarily take up as much room because they're not needed in the same bulk. Um, ashwagandha and guami um, or bakopa are examples of those. Um, also, just showing some pictures there of uh, some of the other herbs that we looked at in the survey uh, today. Very few people are growing skull cap, uh, whereas echinacea is a little bit more common. However, as well as growing the herbs, one of the key things that we need to do to drive this as an industry is develop some infrastructure behind it. We need to look at everything from sourcing the seeds or sourcing high quality seedlings. We need to look at how to grow these plants. I think the majority of us, if, every, if not everybody, um, already grow organically, uh, but that is essential uh, for our industry. Harvesting, if you've got a field full of calendula and you have to go through and pick it, it's a time consuming process. Um, and it's usually manual, so you need to consider how you're going to do that. Drying the plant material to me is one of the most key problems or issues that we need to uh, look at here. And I'll get, come on to that again in, in a minute. Um, but then we also just need to look at packaging and delivery to the client. So not everybody's got the facility to do all of this. So that is why if people grow the herbs and are able to meet the targets of the quantity that's required, if we can have a centralized drying facility where we know that we can dry the herbs to a consistently high standard, that's going to be key to providing herbs to the industry. We need contracts to the producers of our New Zealand supplements, um, cells, teas, so that we know that we are growing for an industry and we're going to get some return from it. Um, we need somebody to manage those contracts. Um, so the next photo here um, just shows a couple of drying facilities that um, are, common, are used today. Um, a lot of us dry on racks, um, a series of sieves stacked on top of each other, stored in the hot water cupboard. They all work for us on a personal level. And some of them like this drying room for small commercial, but we need a bigger facility that's going to provide the quantity of herbs that we're going to be looking at. So Venture Taranaki are looking at some options for us at the moment. Uh, so I'm looking forward to see what they can come up with. Okay, the Herb Federation, we're very pleased to support this project because one of our key goals is to promote the knowledge, use and delight of herbs in the community. And we're also very pleased to support some business prospects. We believe that herbs should provide a key part to keeping ourselves healthy. We grow our own herbs, we can look after our own, own health, but many people don't have the luxury or the space or the inclination to grow their own herbs. And yet they, want to be able to use the products to keep themselves healthy. And this is the commercial market that Phil will tell us a little bit about. Okay, the Herb Federation is a national organization with uh, individuals and community herb groups belonging to it. Uh, we provide a herb certificate course, which is a self-paced module. Uh, we have scholarships uh, for that as well. We've got access to specific herbs with um, detail on how to identify them, how to grow them, their medicinal uses, etc. 
we add to this each year. In fact, March is our Herb Awareness Month, HAM for short. Um, so we'll be doing promotions within the community. We're just trying to plan that at the moment. Um, but as part of Herb Awareness Month, there is an international Herb of the Year, and then we choose three additional herbs to meet a theme. So this year's theme is Herbs for Health. And there are some brochures on the back table, um, if anybody's interested, brochures and information about those. If you miss out, there's plenty of information um, and it's all available on our website, herbs.org.nz. Uh, while I'm talking about things on the, on the table there, um, we also have copies of the quarterly magazine, um, Herb News, and uh, they're free for anybody who would like to take one. Um, there are flyers there if anybody wants information about um, joining and looking for more detail about the uh, Herb Federation. One of the big exciting things we always do is a biennial conference which unfortunately due to COVID was cancelled last year. Uh, but it's three days of fun and education, listening to some excellent speakers from throughout the country. And it is open to non-members as well as members. Um, keep an eye out on the website. Okay, the Stratford Herb Society. Again, we're supporting members and other interested people from throughout Taranaki. We've got people from south of Hawa through to, at the moment, north of Uanui. Um, we recently had somebody from Tikuiti that used to come down to join us. So it's, it's available to anybody and everybody. We want to learn and share our knowledge about the various applications of herbal law. There is a very diverse range of things we can learn about. We only meet once a month. We can't lose everything, learn everything, but we like to introduce people to a range of topics and then they can go away and learn more um, as needed. Uh, we do this through a mix of practical workshops, uh, making salves, tinctures, um, things like that. We have speakers and we have visits to sites of interest. We know that not everybody can come to our meetings because it is on Monday afternoon. So we also have an online group and we have an email list with uh, for I term associates, people who are interested in the group uh, but not able to come to the meetings, and you'll be kept up to date with um, with our information. One of the things we do as a group is a community project. Um, for the last three or four years, we've been working with Pioneer Village, developing their herb garden and maintaining that. And we have plans to, to grow what we're doing there to uh, make more information available to the public, etc. Although we meet in Stratford, which is fairly central to everybody in Taranaki, there was also an informal group recently started in Hawa, but there's nothing up in New Plymouth. And I've had several people ask if we could start another group up here. Unfortunately, I don't have the bandwidth to take on another one, but I would like to see an informal group of interested people that we can meet occasionally, we can meet on, do things online, we can share our knowledge, um, visit each other's herb gardens, and also support each other as we look at the Medicinal Herbs Project um, for those that want to look at growing there. I think it's important to have communal support and this is one way of, of doing it. So hopefully we can get something started on that. I will be leaving a notebook at the um, end table um, if anybody just wants to put their contact details down if they are interested or just email me on um, stratfordherbs at gmail.com. So I'd just like to finish by saying thank you very much to Michelle and the team of Venture Taranaki, both for the initial idea and for all the work that's gone on behind the scenes, developing it into a potential opportunity for us. 
Thank you also to the team of Abacus Bio, who have done a lot of research both to support this venture, both developing some mapping software that we will be looking at tonight, but also looking at the herbs, helping come up with a short list of which are the high value herbs that are going to give us a good return. Thank you all for your support of this project, to all those who have uh, responded uh, to the initial survey looking for information. That data is uh, crucial to what we'll be looking at tonight uh, with the mapping software, um, but any other information and is going to be added as we go along. So, and I just want to say thank you to Jan Smith and Martina here for providing the photos for me. Thank you, Shona. Our next uh, speaker is Phil Rasmussen. Phil is one of New Zealand's most experienced medical herbalists. He's also a pharmacist and founder, founder of Phytomed Medicinal Herbs, a New Zealand-based manufacturer and exporter of herbal medicines for both practitioners and consumers. Phil has 26 years of experience in the industry and is very active in promoting the development of a locally grown, sustainable and export-led New Zealand herbal medicine industry. Phil has generously shared his knowledge and support to this project and has helped us formulate our thoughts around the opportunity. I should also note that I've not spoken to a single person related to the subject without them suggesting that I better call Phil. So we're very fortunate to have him here today to tell us more about his story as well as to share his belief on what is needed to enable a thriving Taranaki medicinal plants industry. Welcome, Phil. Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. Ko hukarangi, ta maunga, ko ta ronga lui, ta awa, ko Ngāti Poro, toku iwi. No toko maru bay, aho, ke te noho aki Auckland. Ko fu rasmasin toku ingoa. Thank you very much to everyone for attending tonight and particularly to Venture Taranaki and Michelle and Shona and everyone else who's helped to put this event together. It's a great privilege to be here. So, yeah, I've been around the block a few years as um, Michelle indicated, um, and hopefully I can share some of that knowledge with you tonight. Um, I often tend to go over time, but it's time for questions at the end. Um, and I'm more than open to answering any questions either during or after this event, okay? I'll put my email address up at the end. But yeah, there is a huge opportunity for Aotearoa New Zealand and of course Taranaki in this space. Huge opportunity. I've been saying this for years and years ever since I studied herbal medicine in the UK, somewhat disunited UK. Um, you know, I learned about all these weird obscure herbs, many of which are now seriously endangered many of which came from third world labour countries and, uh, and they still make up the basis of the industry globally. The ethics of medicinal plant manufacture, growing, manufacturing and trading is pretty dirty actually when you dig deep. Um, it's not particularly sustainable, it's not particularly ethical, it's a bit like coffee and other commodities, it's based on cheap labour. And that needs to change. And I think Aotearoa has a responsibility to contribute to those changes because what better country in the world is there to grow things? Not just Pinus radiata or Chinese gooseberries. Anything that we put our government researchers to and, and our minds to and our great designers and marketers to, as well as our offshore image and our clean green reputation, even though we've got a lot, a lot of... Uh, distance still to go there, um, we can do it. You know, we are the perfect country because of our microclimates, our diversity and our geography and our diverse skill set. We're the perfect country to really get active in this space. Not just growing, but adding value because you have to add value. 
that's that's Aotearoa's problem. Every time we go back to Gisborne, where I was brought up, and I look at the the log sitting there at the, at the port, it's rather depressing. You know, we should be adding value, not just exporting commodities. Uh, but anyway, that's my summary to begin with. But firstly, I mean, herbal medicine, what is it? I mean, I, I like to call it phytomedicine. That's why when I founded the company, I called it phytomed, because phyto is a Latin word for plant. And kauri and totara and, and big pine trees are medicinal. And they're not exactly herbs, are they? They're plants. Most plants have medicinal properties. But there are many, many challenges, as a lot of you here will know. They're really different to single chemical entities, to drug-based entities. And when I jumped ship and got out of pharmacy and pharmacology and into, into phytotherapy or herbal medicine, I started realizing just how complex these things are. Because even the most uh, well-researched Western medical medicinal herb there is, St. John's Wort, and there's well over 2,000 peer-reviewed public publications on it now, we still don't know what the active phytochemical is. And I'm glad that we don't because there's more than one. There's never a single phytochemical or single chemical that is responsible for the activity of that plant. And that's the joy and the richness and the power, the mana of plants. That they work as a team, they collaborate with each other, they cooperate, all those phytochemicals to ensure that not only do you get good oral bioavailability or uh, activity, you no know, bioactivity, they do what you want them to do, they go to the right receptors in the brain or the heart or whatever, but um, they're well absorbed because there's a mate there helping them along. Um, they're properly excreted, they're properly metabolized because they're natural. They're plants that we're meant to eat. We're meant to eat a lot more plants than animals. That's part of, part of the problem. But if you're a product developer or a grower, um, you know, as, as Shona said, seed sourcing is really important. You know, I mean, plants are hugely diverse and it's a bit like, you know, New Zealand, uh, Institute, you know, growing pine trees, getting the right genotype, the right, you know, source is really important before you, you jump in lock, stock and barrel. But it's really, it's quite a complex industry. Um, and, and it's because nature is complex. There's no simple answer and plants are very complex. Um, but of course, there's many examples of where we develop drugs from plants. I, I can mention about 50 of them, but here's some well-known examples. Digoxin used to be widely used for heart failure, not so much now, that comes from Pops Club. Morphine is still the best analgesic known to humankind. It's still what you get when you've got terminal cancer pain. Okay, and it's, a, it's an alkaloid found in opium. Even all the synthetics there, no one here is good. We've got a whole lot of great anti-cancer drugs that have come from plants and quinine, which was you know, really important in, in the past and you know, for malaria treatment and helped to turn the tide in World War II. Um, of course, it comes from chemotherapy species. So I'm not against drugs, you know, I'm still a pharmacist and I did my master's in antidepressants and serotonin and there's a role for drugs, but boy, they're way overused. And as we've seen globally in the last two and a half years, they don't have all the answers. They certainly don't have all the answers. And I think nature is telling us to actually look at it more and, and you know, really look after a lot more. And medicinal plants are seriously under, undervalued. But there are many challenges. If you are developing a product or doing something with medicinal plants, ideally you want to be sure it's safe. And a small percentage of them can be toxic, can be dangerous if they're used inappropriately or manufactured wrongly. Um, we need a truckload more research, particularly around Wangana Māori, around our indigenous species. It's disgraceful in this country, um, given our size, our population and our history, just how little we've invested in researching traditional use of our indigenous species. And most of that research has happened offshore, in fact, not in our own country. And how disgraceful is that? Um, but yeah, are these products foods? Are they medicines? This is a six million dollar question that regulators, and government agencies, and you know staff within the Ministry of Health, and believe me, I've had dealings with them for you know twenty five years now. They continue to grapple with, and companies themselves. If you're going to get into this industry and grow stuff and make stuff out of it, where are you going to sell it? That is a really, really important question. And in my time in the industry, I've seen, I've seen a lot of mistakes made. People growing a truckload of echinacea, you know, hectares and hectares of it, uh, you know, farms and farms growing ginkgo, 
um, and they didn't think about their marketing, what they were going to do with it at the end, and most of it got chopped down or dug up, and it was heartbreaking. So we need to learn from some of these past mistakes that we've made as a country. And one of the biggest ones, I think, overall is lack of collaboration, lack of a well-considered strategy that really incorporates knowledge about in markets and regulations, okay? There you go, I'm jumping, jumping to the end there. But, um, but yeah, why do we need to have all medicine? Why is it suddenly becoming a bit more sexy? It's not just because of this pandemic at the moment, it's because it's been around for everything apart from the last two minutes in a relative one year historical time frame of human medicine. Drugs have only been around for two minutes. Before that, it was plants, it was medicinal herbs, okay? So drugs are quite recent. And what makes us think that they're going to still be, you know, the dominant form of material medicine in another 10, 20, 50 years? They possibly won't because they're not already globally. You know, if you're in uh, Nigeria or um, India, chances are you won't have access to a COVID vaccine. You'll be dependent right now on medicinal plants. And most of the world still is. And, and that's, that's the stark reality. And, and those people are still alive. So there must be something to these plants. Um, but why is the why suddenly are they becoming more popular? I guess all sorts of you know really powerful drivers actually when you put them together. One is aging populations. Secondly, um, people are realizing that drugs don't have all the answers. And thirdly, they're getting more concerned about adverse events of drugs. You know, even HRT, you remember HRT when it was painted as the best thing since sliced bread 20 years ago? Then suddenly they did a, a really large clinical trial. Um, and stopped it halfway through because they realized that generally, not all the time, generally the adverse events outweighed any potential benefits in most women. So, you know, people are realizing that drugs don't have all the answers and they certainly don't. Um, but with climate change and with uh, pandemics and lockdowns, as well as growing demand, supply is starting to fall behind demand. Okay, demand is outstripping supply. That's a general situation. So there are huge opportunities. But one of the biggest challenges is, as I said a few minutes ago, price, what people are prepared to pay and, and the ethics of it. And that was the problem with the ginkgo industry. Nobody apart from my own company, as far as I'm aware, was prepared to pay a reasonable price for that ginkgo because they could get it for a quarter of the price from China. And at the time it wasn't valued. People weren't asking, Hmm, I wonder where that ginkgo is grown. All those ginkgo products out there, you, you try and find out where it's grown and 99% of it, it will come from a country that starts with C. And so, you know, there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of education about provenance, about ethics, about, um, you know, the value chain, the seed to shelf story. And so if we're going to make this industry work for New Zealand, we need to be able to tell a really compelling story and really know where we're going to sell it because we could grow a whole lot. We're, we're a net producer of food. We can grow a lot more food than our population needs. Um, and we can definitely grow a whole lot of plants that the world needs. Um, there are huge opportunities. I um, read this article in the New Zealand Herald in 2011, and I kept it because um, it was based upon a, a futurist, an American futurist who was forecasting things like a, another outbreak like SARS and um, you know socioeconomic unrest and um, you know, uh, viral pandemic, cyber attacks, financial crises, and all these things actually have happened. He, he was a pretty uh, astute futurist. But we're going to see more and more of these things. And, um, you know, supply chain of all sorts, not just medicinal plants, we need to be a little bit more independent and autonomous as a, as a country. And Altura has huge potential to do that. But even more so than certain viruses, I think in the next few years, we're going to see more and more concerns and we're going to experience them, a lot of us personally, around antibiotic resistance. That is going to be huge because, again, the whole paradigm of a single chemical entity that, you know, people can go and buy antibiotics in many countries of the world, they're overused, they're overprescribed, and, and that in itself just encourages uh, microbial resistance and it's becoming a really big problem. And can you imagine when you can't even do elective surgery without a high risk of an infection? So these are very real things that are going to happen in our lifetime. And so New Zealand, when you look at the history of Ongano Māori, some of those indigenous plants, how they were used traditionally by Māori people and early settlers and whalers, and, and, and even now, some of the research that I've been part of, 
they are incredible in terms of antimicrobial activity a lot of them they have huge potential in this space in this topical um, antibiotic type space um, and New Zealand Aotearoa has huge strategic advantage advantages you know I've touched on them already um, but you know look what you can grow in Taranaki and some of those species that um, that Shona showed there. That's just a small snapshot of what you can grow. I mean, my company produces about 250 individual herbal extracts and we only get about a quarter of them grown locally. But I know we can get probably 70, 80% of them locally grown in the old tier row. We bless these microclimates. And we've got a lot of scientists, look what they did with pine trees and kiwi fruit and, and stuff, you know? So they're doing it with black currant, they're doing it with manaka honey, they're doing it with other species. Um, and, you know, certain politicians are going on and on and on about cannabis. For goodness sake, what about all these other medicinal plants, please? Can we extend the conversation and broaden our minds? You know, there's a lot of other plants that also are good for terminal pain in, in North and Bombay. Believe me, and a lot of them grow well here. Um, and all that work to regulate one plant, why don't we just regulate everything properly? You know, and uh, medicinal plants need it. It needs a government strategy. It really needs a government strategy. The kiwi fruit industry didn't take off without government input and money. And, uh, you know, venture Taranaki, you're doing your bit, but actually it needs to go beyond that. It needs to be government. The whole government needs to, to get serious about this. And I've been involved in, in a couple of think tanks in the last few years, and I know there's a lot of good people within government who want to do things in this space. The missing bit is the strong political will to make it happen at the moment. So let's all get a bit grumpy about it and, and keep talking and, and it will happen. But, you know, think, uh, think globally, act locally, and you guys are doing it in Taranaki, which is good. So you're going you're gonna to make a real difference. Um, but, you know, the other good thing about our country is quality. And, you know, believe me, I think we grow the best quality um, medicinal plants in the world. You know, it, it stands to reason, doesn't it? When you pine trees mature in 25 years rather than 75, and when even in China they can't get enough of your, your Chinese gooseberry that you grow here because the quality is so good. Um, black currants, New Zealand black currants, high levels of anthocyanidins, ginkgo, really high levels of terpene lactones and actors, our echinacea, really high levels of. Um, uh, alkalamides if you grow it properly, arnica, New Zealand grown arnica that uh, planted food research, we're doing field tri trials on in Otago years ago when they had funding in this space, really high levels of sesquiterpene lactose, one of the key actives in arnica, which is good topical anti-inflammatory. When you put the science to it and the agronomy and the funding and you really try and optimise quality, we can do it in this country. We are so lucky. And, and it's all about quality. You know, if um, that's what discerning people globally are requiring. I mean, you know, if you're going to drink a beer, you may as well drink a good one. If you're going to have a red wine, you may as well make sure it's a good one. And if you're going to take a, a herbal medicine that's got 10% of the levels of actives that you need to invoke a therapeutic effect, you're going to stop doing it. And or it's not going to pass a clinical trial. And believe me, that's going to be more and more required in the future too. Okay, clinical trial validation. And, and it is pharmaceutical, I'm afraid. It is a really high regulatory bar. It's pharmaceutical. Um, so yeah, there's huge opportunities for this country. Um, and in fact, I remember years ago when Time Magazine did a, did a um, whole issue on New Zealand, um, you know, being um, why, you know, why it was suddenly cool to be in New Zealand. And New Zealand at the time was at a bit of a crossroads. There was an election happening it was just before uh, Helen Clark's government got elected. And biotech was the best thing since sliced bread. The government and, and a lot of uh, government agencies were actively promoting biotech. That's our future, biotechnology. We need GM, we need to have better, better cows, you know, better this, better that. And at the same time, I was trying to export organically certified products, kiwi products to Europe, where they'd had mad, mad cow disease, they'd had foot and mouth disease, and the, the demand for organic products there was huge. It still is, it's way beyond what we have in New Zealand. In Europe and Germany, it's even, even double what it is in the UK. The world really demands clean, green, organic stuff. People who will pay money, who really are educated, who know they want organic. Um, and it wasn't a good look. At, at the same time, I was getting emails from uh, Biotens uh, GM lobbyists saying, we need to lobby the Labour uh, government you know, to, to approve genetic modification. 
And um, so us natural health products were put in the same cluster with the biotech companies. And uh, I didn't like that. I got quite grumpy. I sent a shirty email and, and a few of us got up in arms and we had a meeting. And ever since then, we've had our own industry body, Natural Health Products New Zealand. So there is quite a strong industry body here. And just like the Stratford Herd Society, if you want to get serious and learn more about the industry, I'd recommend you join it um, in the contact details at the end. Anyway, um, yeah, Time Magazine, you know, they did a little piece on us, you know, and at the time it's, should we do the bio-prospecting bio model? Should we be just, you know, uh, like, you know, trawling the sea and then testing everything to see if we find some magic chemical there? Or should we be looking at natural products? And I was a big advocate for natural products at the time because they're quicker to get to market. They're easier to develop, they're cheaper, and actually they're going to have more legs. They're going to have a longer life cycle than most drugs. The failure rate of drug development is really, really low. And the return to iwi and, and uh, tangata whenua and people who live in Aotearoa is a lot less for the drug development model. So, but again, the politicians don't quite get that, some of them. They're still to see the, the big opportunity here. Um, sorry, I've just gone out of... Um, the slideshow for some reason. Now I'm looking for it on the mouth. Is that moving? Yeah, that's moving. Right, that's cool. So, yeah, Phytomed, um, we started about 20 something years ago, 23, 24 years ago. Um, and I studied in the UK. I came back here. I wanted to do things with New Zealand local plants, not just native ones, but, but um, cultivated ones and weedy ones, well crafted ones. I mean, uh, Chinese privet, Ligustrum lucidum, it's the most noxious weed in New Zealand. And uh, it's a highly medicinal plant. And you see it all around the hedgerows, all around the country. Whakatani is terrible. That whole bank of the whole town there is covered with Chinese privet. And there's hundreds of papers on it. It's really good for osteoporosis. It prevents osteoporosis in, in male rats. There's clinical trials on it. It's good for all sorts. And another good one is um, Japanese honeysuckle. The Lassera japonica, the, the one that's flowering at the moment, it's, it again, it's a very common weed in New Zealand, highly medicinal. Now, we're letting these weeds just take over areas of our country and, and you know, where we need to have native species. We should be harvesting them and using them, drying them, using them, developing products out of them, um, giving them to local people with diabetes. I mean, you know, Lassera japonica, Japanese honeysuckle, is really, really good for diabetes type 2, which is costing us taxpayers huge amounts of money and, and killing people, you know, by the, by the truckload. It's, it's really, we need to be looking at these plants, not just growing them, but while crafting the weeds and doing stuff with them as well. So um, anyway, it's been a bit of a journey. Kiwi herb products, um, we export them to Australia and China, and we were doing so to Europe, but not anymore. Um, but kiwi herb is 90% of, of kiwi herb products do have locally grown ingredients in them. We're quite proud of that. But it has been a journey, as I was saying earlier to a couple of people, um, because you know, 25 years ago, there weren't many local growers and there still aren't. There's still not hundreds of them because it's not easy to do it in the commercial world. There's a lot of things to, to you know, things you need to overcome and address and consider before you can make money out of this industry, okay? Um, but yeah, we, we do about 200 other individual products that we sell to practitioners. Well, that's some of our earlier packaging. That was the second lot of Kiwi Herb packaging. Um, we were exporting to the UK. It was kind of funky, you know, artisan New Zealand looking. And then we got more clinical. The current packaging, I haven't got a slide of it, sorry, um, is when we were licensing products in Europe and we had to have a, an outer packaging with Braille on it, um, patient information leaflet. So we, we became a bit more clinical in our look. We're still like that. Um, but that's our part of our phytomed range. And we sell individual herbal extracts to practitioners um, in New Zealand um, and under another party's label, under their brand, to Australia. They sell the naturopaths and herbalists all around Australia. So, um, yeah, there's about 15 uh, native plants, uh, but also, you know, a lot of Chinese and Asian ones, which, as somebody said, they, they also grow well here in New Zealand. Um, and common things like Echinacea and Calendula and all the rest of them. Um, but there's some of our milestones. Sorry, that slide has lost a few arrows. Um, 
<laughs> quite a few errors. Company started trading in 1990. Oh, yeah. Click again. Yeah, thank you. Very good. I'm a bit of an IT dinosaur, as you've noticed. Um, so we started trading in 1998, but I started the company a few years before that because I knew from day one I wanted to get good manufacturing practice, which is the pharmaceutical industry's uh, quality system, basically. Um, GMP certification. And you don't need to have GMP to manufacture herbal medicines in New Zealand. But in every single other so called developed country in the world, you do. And right from day one, I knew that I wanted to export, not to sell to the small local market. And um, I think it's quite reasonable if you're selling herbal medicines that people uh, should be confident that what is written on the label is what is inside and their medicines. Um, I, I don't call them supplements or foods because I treat a lot of cancer patients. I treat a lot of people with serious antibiotic resistance problems and, or mental unwellness. And you know the plants that I use are medicinal. They're there to overcome health issues. They're not there just to top up a crappy diet. Okay, and I'm, I'm not afraid to say that. And that's the model that I think the government needs to look at, which is kind of like the Australian model. They regulate them as medicines over there. It's a high bar, there's a lot of things you need to do, but it's also high value. It's mana and, and it gives you longevity in, in the global marketplace. So anyway, we got GMP. Um, we started Kiwi Herb a couple of years later. Um, we started exporting it to the UK. We moved from my backyard to the first premises in 2001. Um, started exporting to the UK in Singapore, um, and we got GMP with our first MedSafe audit in 2007. Um, and then we yeah, started selling to Australia a few years later. Don't get me onto the, the regulatory nightmares at the time. New Zealand and Australia, not agreeing. Um, anyway, it's all water under the bridge. Um, we started selling to uh, Optimal RX in Australia, all of their products. They, they're the practitioner only company in Australia. That was since 2009. We still make all the extracts for them. Um, uh, in Australia, we started selling QRIB in 2012. Um, we moved again about um, nine years ago now. We've got a much bigger facility. Um, and then last year, we opened a, a Timor store in China. Previously, we were selling to Daigao, which is like the cash and carry, which is what most of the industry do in China. Um, so that's uh, the original manufacturing suite. I, I, I meant to add uh, the initial manufacturing suite. That's in my backyard. Um, that's the current warehouse. It's just a snapshot of some of our some of our raw materials. That's our former finance manager there looking proud at the new bit of kit that he had something to do with. Um, but yeah. You guys in the future, you know, what, what do you want to do? So you've got to think, there's, there's a lot to think about, isn't there? You know, and, and we're all interested in living plants. That's really what is our main interest here is growing things, okay? So, but, you know, what happens beyond the living plant? It, it becomes usually a dried plant. You know, some herbs are processed fresh, but generally they're dried first, as, as um, Shona said. Getting a good dryer that's uh, cost-effective, that is the right size, the right scale, and cheap to run and, and produces good quality dried materials is really important. And I like the idea of a local co-op to do that. that that's a great model. Um, but then you've got to extract your product. You've got your dried herb. What are you going to do with it? You're just going to sell it as a dried herb, or you're going to make a hydrophenolic extract or glycerin extract or a cream or an ointment, or what are you going to do with it? How are you going to extract it? There's a lot to think about. Um, and then I should have the... Uh, well, formulation, and most herbal products are mixtures of different things, or even if it's an individual herbal ointment, like kawa kawa, you've got stuff in there, like beeswax and oil and maybe some you know, antioxidants and things as well. So how are you going to formulate it? And then I've missed the key thing out, which is manufacture. There should be uh, manufacturing between formulation. And then you've manufactured it, you're selling it, but um, are you going to put a shelf life on it, an expiry date? Um, do you need to in the market or markets you're selling them to? And do you need to validate that expiry date? You do if you're selling it in Europe and, and increasingly in Australia. You don't in New Zealand, anything goes here at the moment. Um, but really, do you want to end up in court or, or do you want to you know, sell a product that uh, 
becomes rancid after one year and you give it a three year shelf life. There's a lot to think about here, okay? Um, and, and it all comes back to quality. Um, so you've got to have the right species. Our whole industry has been tainted all too often by the wrong species being used. Um, you know, mistaken identity of the plant. I mean, we employ a botanist who authenticates and, and you know, approves the identity of every single batch that we uh, source or import. Um, and he's a typically only retained botanist, but a really nice guy. He looks at it macro and microscopically, and he measures the foreign matter, he quantifies it, makes sure it's less than 2% as per the pharmacopoeia. And occasionally, once, once a year or so, he picks up that it's the wrong species. But even the Germans or the Americans or the Chinese, they've sent us the wrong blinking species. And that is really life-saving because we want our products to be true to label. You know, you, you, we can't afford to make mistakes like that. So there's a lot to think about. Um, and New Zealand, we have done agronomy studies in the past. I touched upon what plant and food, previously crop and food, used to do. Um, and they've, they're still doing it a little bit. Um, around species like valerian and arnica and echinacea. But the season that you harvest things in, how you harvest it, how you process it, how you dry it, makes a huge difference on, on the raw material quality. And then obviously, inevitably as a result of that, on the finished product quality, okay? Um, so there are, there are a lot of things to consider, okay? Um, there's just a few uh, acronyms to introduce to you. I've talked about good manufacturing practice, GMP, which is the international code that um, you know, most of the world's um, natural product companies adhere to, every pharmaceutical company does. Um, good agricultural practice is basically if you're a farmer, um, say you're an organic farmer, it's just making sure that you don't put a, you know, a ton of horse manure on your echinacea the day before it gets dug, okay? Or that your workers, uh, the toilet that they that they use is not right next to the drying shed and then it's cleaned properly or you know it's just having some basic procedures like the dairy industry has you know I mean the dairy industry got to where it is like it all or not um, you know New Zealand's export based dairy industry only got where it is because of government support and good regulations you know world class robust regulations and we need it for this industry as well. You can't do it on the cheap, I'm afraid. It's got to be world class. That's what New Zealand should be known for. Um, but yeah, we you know we need GAP farmers and growers need to start thinking a little bit. It's you need a pest control. If you've got a big drying shed, you, you don't want rats coming in there pooping all over because there's holes in, in the shed. You know, it's just basic stuff is better than nothing. Okay. And, and then if you're testing your product and you want to show you that it's got really high levels of inactive, say alkalamides in echinacea, um, which lab are you going to get to test it? Are you going to get it done at a Mickey Mouse lab that hasn't validated its method, it comes up with an artificially high result, or are you going to use a, an approved lab, and a, a reputable one with a validated method? Okay, so the labs themselves also need to have some procedures in place, some documented procedures around staff training, method validation, et cetera. It's just a no-brainer when you think about it, okay? Um, and then your products out there in the marketplace, last but not least, I'm afraid you do have to think a little bit about safety, pharmacovigilance. I mean, um, I don't think there's any products out there that I'm aware of in the herbal uh, medicine space that are anything like thalidomide was, but prevention is better than a cure, okay? If you don't look and uh, encourage people to give you feedback on what might be wrong with your product or what's going moldy or all that, um, you're not going to improve your product. You're not going to continually increase the, the quality of your product, which is what you need to do, okay? So we do need to at least consider pharmacovigilance, I'm afraid. Um, but echinacea, is, is, uh, it does grow well here and there are a number of people growing it. Now, um, that's taken from our organic grower in Canterbury in the drought a few years ago. Uh, the bees love it. It is a lovely plant to have in your garden, just from a you know um, diversity perspective, let alone a commercial perspective. Um, I've talked about some of those pharmacopoeial standards. Um, there's a couple of books there. Um, is your product going to be a tea? Is it going to be a medicine or a food? You know, just things to think about. Um, 
but make sure you you have got the right species before you start growing it. And um, these are just some of the tests you, you might want to do on it, particularly if you're not growing organically or you're importing plants, you, you do need to think about pesticide contamination. And I know an organic grower in New Zealand who's selling um, a species of plant to uh, organic companies in Europe who can get it grown organically in Europe, but the, uh, the levels of glyphosate residue in the organically grown herb in Europe are so high now um, that, that they want somewhere that's cleaner and they're coming to New Zealand because we don't have the same level of glyphosate Roundup residues. So, um, you know, pesticides are quite an issue sometimes. And again, you know, most growers are responsible, but how do you know that that species, particularly in a, in a poorer country like India or parts of China, um, wasn't grown on a form of tin mine and there's all this cadmium residue or something? How do you know unless you look? Okay. So you might think I'm over the top, but, you know, um, I'm really risk averse in terms of, you know, quality and safety because. This industry deserves to, to be way up there in its quality parameters for our country. Um, if you are going to grow commercially and you're going to sell to you know, one of the New Zealand producers or, or manufacturers or export even, um, you're going to need to learn a little bit about a certificate of analysis. Okay, Now that's basically your bit of paper that you supply with your raw material and it um, summarises the tests that you've had done on it. You might have had a botanist certify that it's authentic. You might have had the botanist quantify the foreign matter. You might have tested it for a particular active, either at uh, Cawthorn Institute or Southern Cross University in Australia, Cawthorn and Nelson, or one or two other labs in New Zealand. But um, you know, you might have tested it for something, and you, you want that on your certificate of analysis. It validates that it's a quality product. Um, you might you should test it for microbes. Um, that's a whole story in itself, but. Um, you know, some companies insist that you test for aflatoxins, which are fungal toxins, um, you know, mycotoxins that are produced by fungi. And in some parts of Europe, that's a, a requirement if you're going to be buying uh, dried medicinal herbs. So it can get quite expensive, this. You know, so if you're going to do it en masse and you're going to sell tons of a herb, especially exporting or to a serious GMP certified New Zealand manufacturer, you do need to start thinking about these tests and incorporating it into your, your, your cost structure. Okay? But again, that's the benefit of our country. These things are less of a risk, less of an issue. And we have the lab capability and the scientific capability, which is great. Um, but it's better to grow things, to cultivate them than wild craft, apart from those weeds that I touched on earlier. Um, you know, we should be cultivating kawa kawa, not just going into the bush and, and grabbing it like, like Glenn was saying earlier. That's what people do. Uh, no, we should be cultivating in the right varieties. Um, here's an example of a bit of research that Coffin Food previously um, did uh, down at their um, field research station in central Otago. This was a slide that was given to me by, I think it was Dennis Lauren or... Um, uh, somebody from Coffin Food, um, might have been Jim Douglas, who's retired now. He lives in Oamaru. Um, this is when they were researching golden seal. Now, that is a high value medicine plant, golden seal. Um, I've seen it growing in Aotearoa twice in the past, many years ago. Uh, one by Graham Reed in Tapuki, and he was growing quite a lot. Um, it takes years to grow. You have to grow it under shade. So he was growing it under trees uh, with heavy mulching, a bit like growing ginseng commercially. Um, and uh, unfortunately, he dug us all up in a hurry one day and, and I managed to get a few plants spread around with different herbalists around the country. There are people growing it, a few here and there. But the only other time it was growing commercially was somebody in the Palmerston North area. A really good quality uh material, but unfortunately he died and there was a prop failure and, and it never carried on. But, um, the, the story though that I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to say is that depending on the part of the plant, you get different levels of the actives, okay? And that's what this slide showed. Um, it showed the hydrastin and berberine, the, the alkaloids, the key known two actives and golden seal also found another berber species, barberry, even the noxious barberry we have in our country, the one that, you know, has real pickles and it's real nuisance, um, probably contains really high levels of these alkaloids and quite yellowish in colour. Um, 
really highly medicinal. You look at the history of golden seal in North America, it's one of the, along with echinacea, it's one of the most famous Western medicinal plants when it went to Europe because it's good for infectious diseases. Okay, it's a really good antibiotic type herb. And you need to look at growing it for years. It's quite an investment, but it is a potentially lucrative crop for New Zealand because there's a shortage globally at the moment. Although there are a number of um, young growers getting into it in the US because the US government is actively encouraging medicinal herb growing there and funding it and doing more field trials. So again, you know, before we all jump into this in Aotearoa, let's just do a real market appraisal as to what is actually happening elsewhere before we invest too much. We'll learn from past mistakes. But here's just an example of a few herbs, a few medicinal plants that are been growing, being grown currently in our country. There's a lot more. Um, I could talk to each of them. That's St. John's Walk, which is in my garden. Um, it's a weed, it's a weed in central Otago. New Zealand growing St. John's Walk has high levels of hypericin in it, which is the red pigment, which isn't necessarily that great. It's not an active, I don't think. The antidepressant activity of St. John's Wort. Um, last but not least, that's American ginseng and it's Pinkophonium. Again, a highly lucrative medicinal plant um, for a lot of good reasons. Um, it's botanically related to Panax ginseng, which is indigenous to the Chinese continent and mainly sourced from Korea these days, Korea and the Chinese mainland. But um, America and, and the US and Canada and, and um, you know, northern US states. Uh, there's a related species, and, and Chinese uh, herbalists found out about this in the 1800s, and they realized that it was at least as good as their own indigenous species. And so a, a trade began from North America back to China, and increasingly it became endangered, and it's seriously endangered now. Um, so the price is really high, and, and it needs to be cultivated, and it is being cultivated. It's a grower in uh, Wisconsin. That's how they grow. And you can imagine what the investment required in that is. But probably not that much more than, than kiwi fruit in this country. When you, you drive around Gisman, you see all the investment they're having to make into growing apples and kiwi fruit now. I mean, sure, you need to build shade cloths and wait three to four years to get a return, but we can do it here. We can do it. Um, you end up with roots um, that are, you know, about uh, five or seven or nine centimetres long. Um, that's what some of them look like. But, um, you know, I love this species because... Um, it's highly medicinal, and and I was I gave a lecture about it again yesterday to another online forum because there's clinical trials on this plant in, in patients with cancer, patients with schizophrenia, and patients with diabetes, diabetes, and all three of those scenarios really good outcomes where it's used as an adjunct alongside their their uh, drug based treatment. Okay, and I haven't got time to talk in detail about them, but that's pretty compelling. Okay, it, it is a really useful medicinal plant. And I use a lot of it in my own um, clinical practice. Um, so there's an opportunity for that for our country and Paranaki as well, I suggest, as well as Echinacea. I won't, I'll probably run out of time, so I won't talk more about Echinacea, but I mean, when you dig and grow, uh, when you dig and, and wash and dry, and that's really important actually, the washing and the dry are really uh, probably the most expensive stages of medicinal plant commercial growth actually it's not the planting it's not the weeding necessarily it's the, the digging the washing and the drying that's where you can spend a lot of money if you really haven't thought about it okay um, but you do need to mechanize it if you're if you're serious and you want to make money or and be anything other than a, than a small holder doing this okay but you know new, new zealand researchers um nigel perry at otago uh, discovered years ago that you dig it, you, you dry it, and if you don't store it at a, a cold temperature, the levels of alkalamides decline quite quickly. You see the red ones there, the orange lines, that's um, at room temperature at 20 something degrees, 24 degrees, they decline much quicker than if you freeze it. Okay, and, and, uh, and yet still in the US, they don't want to know about that. They're quite happy to sell you stuff that's been in the warehouse two, three, five years and is really low on alkalamides because a lot of the rest of the world, people aren't asking these questions because they're not as educated as we are in Australasia, dare I say it, and they're not as discerning. And, and again, the industry is far from evolved in some parts of the world. But yeah, these are just some considerations. 
Um, I've touched on a lot of them already. Um, I've touched on regulations that is huge and very, very complex. And yes, at times, extremely frustrating subject. And I've learned a lot about it. I know quite a bit about it, particularly in the North American, Australia, New Zealand, and European context. Um, but I've learned a lot and I've seen, um, you know, a lot of mistakes being made in this industry in the past. Um, and I'm happy to share, you know, my thoughts and experiences on, on some of those with any of you, as I said. Uh, but I still remain extremely passionate about this industry for our country. And I, I'm really excited that this event is happening. So thank you very much. Companion plants. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of science around, um, you know, synergistic interactions between plants, like there is between phytochemicals, and um, companion planting is definitely a good way to do it rather than monoculture. Um, I guess, you know, one of our commercial growers in particular, you know, he, he rotates. He doesn't just have the same species in that row year after year. And, and I mean, I do it in my own car. You know, there are certain things like the, you know, the meadow sweet doesn't, doesn't like being next to, um, you know, the Ella campaign. Um, you know, there's just things you notice in nature and there's a lot, yeah. And yet, if you're going to, cut herbs um, mechanically, dry them, you know, harvest them mechanically, it becomes quite challenging that. Yeah. Is there anybody uh, in large scale and that might be your own business? Do we have anybody who's uh, cultivating? Um, just in the scale? Not, uh, to be quite honest, no. Um, I mean, some of the black currant growers um, in the South Island in particular, I think that would possibly be getting up to around 100 hectares, I'd say. Um, but they've had a checkered career as well. You know, um, they shift the production uh, to, to China for a few years and it backfired on them and the whole black currant industry went down a bit, but it's come back again now. Um, but no, we're talking more, um, you know, less than 100 hectares. You know, we're talking. I think, you know, growers, it depends, you know, it depends on your model. Are you just growing one or two species? Are you just growing echinacea and, and, and oats or are you growing 10 species? And is it just you you're trying to make a living out of or, or are you employing a lot of people? Um, but you need, if you as a single person or a couple perhaps, you know, you want to get into this space and, you know, give up your day job in a few years, um, you need a few hectares you need you know, at least two to, to five hectares. Um, unless you're gonna be adding value to what you grow by making stuff and selling it at the local farmer's market or something, you know, that, that's a, a viable model as well. But no, the scale is nothing like a hundred hectares for individual species, as far as I'm aware. Yep. Yeah, I, I think you know we can you know Watties is an interesting one, you know, and um I know Watties because I'm from Brisbane originally. And um yeah, but they they had a huge factory in Brisbane and in, in Hastings and, and they they had value added finished products and, uh, and an existing market for it. And they built that market further. And then of course they sold to Heinz. But I think the biggest limitation is the market, the strategy and the market brands, or even, even creating a brand offshore, brand awareness offshore is really, really challenging and it doesn't come cheap. Yeah, you know, we're trying with our Kiwi Hip brand and we're getting there, but it's not easy. I mean, look at Converti, they're one of the biggest companies in this industry. And uh, you know, even they struggle at times because they're still actually quite small compared to some of the really big companies in this space. 
So I think the limitation is is at, at the end. It's the marketing, and it comes. You know, the dairy industry, the kiwi fruit industry. They didn't just happen overnight. They took years and years. But uh, both of them got to where they are based upon quality, you know, quality through and through. And that's what we have to do in this industry. We have to start as we mean to go on and, and not end up being a sort of cheap cast wine or whatever. You know, we need the agronomy research, but we also need a strategy more than anything, you know, in business, a good strategy that is regularly reviewed and challenged. I think that's really, really important. Yeah. Old manufacturing shed, yes, yes. Sorry, I'm, I, I haven't got a photo of the new one, but you can look at our website, fightingmed.co.nz, and you'll see a, a few photos. Yeah. How much what, sorry? Uh, yeah, it's it's a yeah, it's a reasonable facility. Um, I forget how many square meters it is, but um, it's probably you know about at least eight times the size of this this room here. Um, the production suite is probably about four times the size of this room, uh, but you know the warehouse is is about ten times the size of this room. You know, warehousing you, we we. Lead times are really long when you're importing medicinal plants by sea. We don't want to air freight them in. We do it occasionally, but um, and inventory management is really challenging in this industry, particularly when we have a long tail. We have a lot of products because we sell to practitioners. You know, some things we might only sell 50 units a year off, but we still have to have them in our product portfolio because uh, medical herbalists like me, you know, once a year they really want that herb. That product and if you don't do it they'll go to your competitor so and and with covid supply chain has been a real nightmare for the whole industry globally as i say and and you know ashwagandha was mentioned earlier i mean the price of ashwagandha has really gone up in recent years and the quality has gone down it's just what happened to the kava um many many years ago you probably heard about kava when demand went really high because of good clinical trials and you know people being anxious realizing it's better than valium and you know uh, suddenly the quality went down because it takes a few years to grow a carpet plant you don't just grow it in six months and corners started to be cut and then we started getting into problems with hepatotoxicity and, and these are lessons we should learn from you know rung wasn't built in a day and this industry won't be built in a week or, or even one season yeah, a, a collaborative, um, strategic um, approach is highly needed. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Look, well, well, I'm I'm a real advocate of it, but not everyone in my company is. Um, and New Zealand is way behind most of the rest of the world when it comes to organics, in my opinion. I mean, a few years ago, and it's probably still true now, less than 1% of our agricultural land in this country is certified organic. And uh, my view is if you're not certified organic, you're probably not organic. You know, again, if you want to trade in the real big world out there, you've got to be certified. You've got to be able to prove that you are doing what you say you're doing. But, you know, the she'll be right, of course I'm organic attitude is not good enough if you want to export okay and i'm a i'm a huge advocate of organics not only because i've lived in europe and i've seen the potential there the demand for it but also you know i i do worry when i see the level of pesticide use you know around gisborne all that all those tomato farms that you know um that still exist around gisborne and then the amount of glyphosate they use there it really worries me and you know we have a very high rate of cancer in this country and, and yeah if you if you're going to grow something um, and you know, you limit. How, we've got to compete with Chile. We've got to compete with China. What's our business model as a country? Are we going to be a commodity volume trader, or are we going to be a, a quantity volume trader and cheap, or are we going to be high value limited? We've got to be high value. And so, why wouldn't you be organic? It adds value. Sorry. To understand the 
I'm quite keen that some of us do. Some of us are not going to talk to people. It leads up to discuss as much as it's collaboration and just being in the same way. Because we mentioned about the importance of this practice of the start, I don't know if you have a view about if this is something that should be involved or should be actually something that holds us together around the development. Because we are identified that the organic principles and practices, those that those of us that are not stoners, so one of them starts to just become a habit. Our horticulture is a good Yeah, I, I think, look, you know, there's room for all sorts, you know, and, and we use a lot of non organic herbs as well. Um, because we can't get them certified organic. But kiwi herb is mainly certified organic. Um, but yeah, we have to gradually ease ourselves of being so chemically dependent, I think, as a country. I'm just asking, we are the beginning of the identification of what? The identification of what? I think I'm angry. I think we've got such a very good system. What we're going to show you shortly. Thank you very much, Paul. Well, All right. Um, yeah, that was really awesome, and I think it gave us a lot to think about and a fantastic overview. So we really um, thanks so much for being here. Um, next, right. So I'm I'm now going to welcome up Anna Campbell. So Anna has a PhD in plant biology, uh, sorry, biotechnology, and has keen interests in the use of plant bioactives for human health. So Anna was at Abacus Bio from 2007 to 2021 in a variety of roles in, uh, including managing director and partner. Abacus Bio is a private company bridging science and business and operating in 20 countries. In 2020 Anna co-founded Zest Wellness, a company that aims to change lives with natural products. And Anna was also the lead on our project with Abacus Bio. So today she'll be sharing findings of their research to identify those plants with the most uh, commercial opportunity for Taranaki. And of course, this was based on information that was shared by many of you in the room or um, on Zoom um, in terms of how we developed the long list of plants. So welcome, Anna. And while she comes up, it might be a good time to stand up and stretch your legs. Thanks, Anne, if you want. I'm quite happy to sit down to it while I'm speaking. I, uh, I realize that I'm an incredible act to follow in the previous speakers, the knowledge base of, of Shona and Phil combined uh, uh, is actually, it's, it's really inspiring. And when we talk about collaboration and, and how to collaborate, it is through leaders like Shona and Phil that we will be able to develop the kind of country and the type of exports and type of products that we need to. And so I guess I'll just start off personally. Um, I haven't been to New Plymouth now for 28 years. Um, the last time, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure whether to tell you the story, but the last time I was in New Plymouth, uh, I was here for my boyfriend at the time, was 21st, and <laughs> um, he drank too much. I spent the night crying. <laughs> <laughs> and I went home the next day. So um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of nice to be back here. I hope the said boyfriend's not in the audience. <laughs> um, and, and kind of revisit my new Plymouth connections. 
I also got another time we came up, I got stuck in Hawara uh, when we were hitchhiking. So yeah, interesting story. <laughs> but it is as I flew into New Plymouth last night, I, you know, it, it, it's it's a special place. And not only is it a special place, but it's incredibly productive. And uh, and I, my husband and I dairy farm for a long time, so I have an affinity with the dairy industry. Um, but it, it perhaps isn't the best use for a lot of our land. And and it's not to say that it's an either or, or it's an either or, but I think there's a lot of integration that we can do um, with dairying and with other sorts of land uses to start incorporating um, medicinal herbs, medicinal plants uh, into into our land use. And so I think there's really huge opportunity. And, and coming from Otago, where we have some pretty cold weather, um, one of the really big challenges for us in doing this project was actually ruling out plants on the basis of agronomy, but I'll get to that in a moment. You made it very difficult for us. Um, before I start to, I should also introduce Lou May Cock, who's, uh, who's done a huge amount of the research for this project and will be the, the first person that I go to if the question is too hard. So I guess I'll just build on what Phil um, brought up really about the future, because I think I think the future is really exciting and the more that we talk about this, then the more people that are outside of our circle will start to believe us. Um, you know, the, the, the nutraceutical industry, I call the nutraceuticals, plant medicines, um, it's, all, it's all a bit blurred, but uh, when I think about it, I think about it in, in many, many forms, but I also incorporate uh, what I call functional foods and functional beverages into this really broad church. Um, and the, the main reason I really incorporate this is that we, society has some pretty big problems around health. Obviously, highly processed food um, and limited biodiversity of our food. So most of the food that we actually eat, or something like 70% of the plants that we eat are based on three or four crops. So rice, wheat, potatoes, and corn. Uh, and... Um, some really interesting data coming out recently in terms of our diet that we should be eating 30 plant species a week, um, which is actually not too bad to do if you start eating seeds and nuts and so forth. Um, but when I took it to some of my colleagues at Abacus Bio, they decided to take up the challenge of eating 30 animal species in a week. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it kind of goes to show that we, we, we have, we, we're just not really thinking about what we're putting in our mouths. Um, on top of that, we have this dominance of big food companies and the dominance of the big food companies is very much what Phil described that he's seeing in the herbal markets is that uh, as, as price drives everything, quality goes down uh, and when we're, you know, there's, a, there's a, a great study in New Zealand where they've gone into a supermarket and looked at two thirds of packaged products and said that two thirds of packaged products that you can see in, the, in a supermarket are unhealthy. Um, and so what's driving the production of these products is profit, not health. And this is right through to the, some of the new food movements. So I'm really interested in the plant-based protein space, but also um, plant-based milks and so forth. We're having the same issues in those industries and in that we're not actually producing anything that is even moderately healthier than um, what it's supposed to be replacing. In fact, they're high in salt, high in sugar, high in processed elements. So um, we have some major global challenges that are led um, by some of our major food producers. And then, of course, the pace of our life uh, sometimes also um, drives the wrong decision-making. And believe me, I eat the wrong things plenty of times, so I never want to point a finger. But I think in terms of what's really exciting in terms of the global markets is that uh, the the global market for nutraceuticals is, is currently over, well, it's probably close to 300 billion US, which is, for, you know, 450 billion New Zealand, and expected to reach 440, if that's very exact, uh, billion by 2026. COVID, if anything, has escalated this trend, and the demand for immunity products has obviously gone through the roof, um, and we've seen that in the supply chain. One, uh, in my new company, one of the Ingredients I use a lot of is quercetin. Its price has almost tripled, quadrupled in the 18 months since I set the company up. Um, what's also really interesting, and again, this is picking up on what Phil said, is that the pharmaceutical industry and the nutraceutical industries are converging. So uh, this kind of, people are realising, there's two things that are driving this. There's a distrust of pharma, Big farmer, and I've just started reading the book um, uh, Empire of Pain. Has anyone read it? 
So it's a book about the um, opioid family in the US. It's pretty scary. And, and when you start to read books like that, you understand that the distrust of pharma is not a distrust of science, it's a distrust of uh, corporations. And um, I think what we're seeing globally in, two, in terms of the, the freedom movement or whatever we want to call it, it's, it's, I think it's naive to just say they're the bad guys and we're the good guys. I think, I think there's some really major underpinning societal trends that are causing these kind of movements. So it's really important that we're cognizant of that when we think about the values that we might set up for any kind of company or, 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 or movement that might happen in Taranaki. Um, so anyway, so the pharmaceutical movement, so the pharmaceutical movements, companies are starting to look to the nutraceutical companies as well, because it's much easier for them to get into the game, uh, there's less regulations for uh, to, to take a nutraceutical product to market than there is a pharmaceutical product. Um, and then as Phil said, the nutraceutical market is now, there is it going to be more and more requirement around the nutraceutical market to have clinical trials and evidence. So we're going to see this convergence of the two and we're going to see big pharma coming into nutraceuticals in a really big way. Uh, the, the major trends driving this are obviously rise in chronic and, and non-communicable diseases, baby boomers, um, and the demand for natural plant-based products. So in terms of, I guess, thinking about the challenges for the industry is the regulator, regulatory compliance barriers, barrier, which we've already spoken about, so I won't go into that too much, other than the if, if we're talking here about taking a national leadership position, which I think we should, then... There, is, there are some jurisdictions, and Phil will be able to add to this, but uh, Canada Health is one that I've been really interested in. Some jurisdictions in the world that, that do natural health very, very well, and that they actually look at the science and then allow the people that are growing and making products to talk about the science. In New Zealand, we're not even allowed to talk about the science on our labelling. It's immensely frustrating. Um, there is a fragmented competitive landscape. Now, this is going to create an opportunity. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but we've, we're kind of moving away from nutraceuticals, I think, from this big dominant, uh, these big dominant global companies to more and more small companies. And so the big, the big companies see that as a threat, but obviously we would see that as an opportunity. Um, and then the, the other challenge, this is the big challenge for pharmaceutical companies is, that it's very difficult to protect a whole plant in terms of patent protection and so forth. And um, the pharmaceutical model is to go one compound for one disease. Uh, the plant medicine model, as Phil alluded to, is really to think of it more holistically and to think of all those compounds interacting together and interacting in our very varying bodies um, in different ways. And, and so, that's much, the second part is much, much harder to protect. So how does a big pharma company make money if they can't patent this technology? And this, this has also been the downfall of the natural health industry in that it's kind of a, a double-edged sword. It's a downfall in that we can't protect things because they're so complex, but it means that we then can't get the scale that we need to. So it's very interesting. So consumers, I think, will drive that scale. Um, and so really, I've just... I quickly go back to this fragmented competitive landscape. Um, the new business that I've started, our main reach to consumers is a direct consumer model. Um, we could not have done this even, I think even three years ago. We could have started doing it three years ago, but COVID has pushed everyone right up to 80 and 90 year olds online and buying online. And so our ability to reach people directly and sell our brand, sell our ethics, sell our values, um, rather than through a wholesale or a distribution network, are suddenly tangible and right there for us. And so then thinking about what the Vinch Taranaki story might be, what the ethics and value might be behind growers, your ability to connect with consumers, the types of consumers that want your product is there in a way that has never been there before. And that is incredibly exciting. So in terms of the work that we were doing at Abacus Bio, is that we were really driven to, um, from the team at Venture Taranaki to look at the land here and say, well, 
ask what are the what are the what are the key plants that you could be growing? And it's kind of a million dollar question when you when you live in an area like this because you can grow so much. And so we obviously looked at it from multiple perspectives. At, at, at the agronomic perspective was one perspective, but also the market perspective, the scientific um, data, as well as supply chains perspectives. And so when we're going through this, you'll see that we roll out plants um, that might be your favourites. And we're really happy to be debated and argued over plants because we were looking at it with our criteria, but um, you'll know things that we don't know. And just in terms of this next step, really like to acknowledge um, Shona and the, the wide bunch of growers out there that have contributed um, plants and contributed discussion to this process as well. So what did we do? So yeah, essentially we, we, we had a long list from the Taranaki growers, um, what can we grow? Um, we looked at what the market wants. And I just wanna add here, the market wants is, is often a retrospective look. Um, so it's interesting to also think, well, what might the market want? And we didn't really look at what might the market want, but I think it's really important to think about that and think about even things from a disease perspective. perspective. So something like the rise of anxiety um, as, a, as a kind of a, um, a challenge for people. Do you as a bunch of growers say, well, actually we might, bunch together around this particular disease or disease or, or health outcome. So there's different ways we could have approached it. We looked at it as a, as a sort of a retrospective, what does the market want now? Um, we also looked at the strength of the scientific evidence and this ruled a lot of plants out, unfortunately. And it's not because those plants wouldn't necessarily have good science credibility. It's just that um, both in New Zealand and internationally, we have underinvested massively in natural plant medicines and understanding plant um, medicines. This is despite the fact that 60% of pharmaceuticals are either derived directly from plants or are a synthetic analog derived from plants. So there's a huge number of pharmaceuticals that are derived in some way either directly or indirectly from plants, but yet only 6% of the world's plants have actually been looked at for any medical kind of function. Um, interesting, the ones that are derived, the pharmaceuticals that are, are derived from plants are very, very often um, derived for their original use. So if a, if a plant was used for digestive purposes originally, then often actually that's what the pharmaceutical outcome is as well. So, you know, backing up everything that the previous speakers have said, uh, there, we, we should be learning from what has gone before us. And um, one of the very, very first botany projects I worked on actually was um, on, a, on a plant called liverwort, which is a type of moss. And I was working on a bioactive with Nigel Perry and, and liverworts. And I read recently and I, I, um, that in Rungawa medicine, the Māori medicine, um, they used to use a cannabinoid um, in liverworts for, for medical use. And now we're raving about cannabis um, and Māori we, we're developing, we're using liverworts or cannabinoids, cannabinoids um, from them, you know, hundreds of years ago. So, you know, we, we need to learn from the past um, and, and use our, our modern technology to, to take it more widely. And then really um, the next, the final step was really selection for further analysis and trials. So what got down to our short list and then, um, Work, you know, working with Michelle and Co to say, well, what are the next steps from here? So, um, the most developed this fantastic spreadsheet, which I promise I won't show you any more than this, uh, but it's a, it's a wonderful scoring system um, that allowed us to really quantitatively assess the plants that um, the Taranaki group gave to us. And while I say um, quantitative, we were as quantitative as we could be, but there were definitely qualitative outcomes. And I'll show you the, a couple of them in a minute where we had to rule something out. Um, in a way that you might argue. So this was the long list um, from Birch Taranaki, uh, and we added one at the top, Nigella Sativa, but everything else came from you. Uh, Nigella Sativa is a bit of a favorite of mine. It's an anti-inflammatory um, seed, black seed or black cumin um, that, they, that they use a lot in India. Um, so ha yep, have a look at that, and I'll fl keep flicking through. Um, in terms of the start of the process, so the first question was fundamentally, could the plant grow in Taranaki? And then we really uh, scaled the, the scientific evidence. And 
you know, looked at the quality of that scientific evidence as well. And as I said before, some plants just didn't make the top list, not because they are not scientifically valid, but because they just haven't been studied enough. And then really, is there an existing market or an opportunity to, to expand? So they were our first three questions to narrow down that long list to 10 plants. Um, these were the 10 plants that we were left with. Can you all see them? Um, so we, we, were, we were narrowing down um, and I'll keep moving on. So then the next steps really around these five plants, it was quite a com sort of complex project with lots of scoring and lots of debates, but um, we've simplified it here. Was, uh, so one thing is that as a real challenge is seed accessibility. Um, Phil talked about it as well, that, it, that uh, you, you decide to grow something and then actually, first of all, you've got to find out is the seed in the country? If the seed's not in the country, is it going to be easy to get the type of quality seed that you need to grow? And are you actually going to get the right genus and species? Um, are, are there any major concerns uh, in terms of thinking about that supply chain? Um, things like processing, uh, we were also cognizant, I guess, that um, if you're going to develop an industry here, then some of the more complex processing might not be attractive. Um, on the flip side of that, it could be attractive because it might be a way to differentiate. And then what are really the cultivation requirements and the end product value? And that led us to our final five plants, which um, were Echinacea, which has been talked about lots today. Um, ashwagandha, which is one of the products I use and one of my new products, so it's um, one that I'm very fond of and if you ever decide to grow ashwagandha then I'll be one of your buyers because at the moment I'm buying from India. Uh, motherwort and uh, calendula, which we've also talked about today, marigold, um, and kawakawa, which we've also talked about. Now we, we um, for the purposes of this project, because I know there's an Indigenous project going on, um, we're not going to talk so much about the uh, indigenous or native species. Um, if we hadn't put kawakawa on that list then, the last one to fall off was actually passion flower. And um, passion flower is a really, really interesting one for um, stress, anxiety, and so forth, and insomnia. And so as a topic, I think that's a really, really interesting topic because I think people are desperately in need of natural products for that. But we ruled out passion flower because it's a vine. And um, so it's a little, it's, it's harder to grow at the kind of scale that you might need to. But then I was sort of thinking, because someone put a slide up before with hops written on it. And I thought, well, if you had a hops industry in Taranaki, is, and I don't know the answer to this, is there a way that you could potentially grow passion flower alongside hops in a vine type arrangement? I've got no idea, but um, these are the kind of things. So while I'm saying those are the top five for the moment, there are some fringe dwellers that could come back on or off um, with a bit of debate. Uh, so just really quick, quick, we then really looked at each of these plants a little bit further in terms of thinking about um, the supply chain and so forth, and I'm just quickly going to run through Echinacea, I wish I'd chosen Ashwagandha now because we've already talked about Echinacea, but uh, I thought I'd just choose one to talk about a bit further. So it is a flowering plant which is native to North America, uh, it's a perennial herb and it, oh, the whole plant can be um, can be used and this is one of the factors that we did consider in, in our analysis was um, plants to get at a, a, a higher score if we could use the whole plant rather than just parts of the plant so um, with echinacea you can harvest the flowers and the leaves um, and then after about three or four years you can also harvest the roots um, spring spring stone and uh, someone asked before about companion plants it actually pairs really well with valerian. So these are other things that would be really worth considering, um, thinking about as uh, how you might um, grow and um, swap these types of plants around. Um, so it's propagated, it can be propagated from seed, but also from root sections. Um, and an answer, I guess the question over here about um, scale is a really, really interesting one. I'm gonna just jump across to some work we did in Nigella Sativa um, when I'm thinking about the scale. One of the challenges with many of these plants is they've had very little agronomic, agronomic work done in a mechanized system. And so they haven't been, I'm, I'm a geneticist by training the last 15 years, I've been a geneticist. So um, what we do is breed plants and animals. Um, and often some of those traits that you breed for are to breed those plants to be the right height, to breed um, the seeds so they don't pop 
too early. If that makes sense, you don't lose yield. So you're breeding plants to have higher yield. You might breed plants to have natural disease resistance. So in terms of thinking about the scaling piece, um, Phil's dead right. This is not an overnight thing. It's something that if, if we decide on several crops that have the right market opportunity, then there is a breeding and an agronomy piece that goes alongside it that really allows us to um, scale to the level we need. And the work that we did around Nigella and Sativa was actually for the Australian market. And um, we, we were estimating it would take us sort of five years really to reach a commercial scale um, of, of yield that we needed um, and beyond that to really do the breeding. And part of that was to really look at uh, what kind of cultivars were out there and actually assess some of the genetics that are already out there and select for the, the right genetics for the region and so forth. So there are quite a few steps. Um, but the opportunity, because a lot of these plants have not been selected for, so they haven't been bred for, they haven't been um, optimised um, agronomically, the opportunity is also really, really considerable to jump from quite low yields to quite high yields reasonably quickly. <clears throat> They do, the seeds do require um, stratification or some sort of cooling before use and they and they like a rich, well-drained soil. Many of you growers will know far more about um, this than I, than I do, so I'll jump really quickly. Um, in terms of health, uh, reduced inflammation, immunity, so echinacea has obviously gone up um, because of what's been happening globally, uh, but reduces anxiety and there's some interesting um, possibilities around cancer as well. So in terms of the actual market, the global echinacea extract market is um, 1.5 billion US in 2019, and that's predicted to rise to 2.9 billion in 2027. It's the number two best-selling medicinal herb in the US. And uh, I, think, I think it's really interesting thinking about what kind of markets, if you were to develop something, then what kind of export markets you might drive for, because that kind of thinking does may potentially shape um, what you grow as well. Um, and different forms as well. So different forms of echinacea sell for different levels of price and that often depends on the, the level of processing and the degree of quality of that end product. So I guess in terms of the next steps really, um, for me the really, really obvious next steps are to, to you know, get around this shortlist and potentially some of the fringe dwellers on the shortlist and say, well, what what, could, what, would, what would we look to trial? What could we look to say um, to start to build some of our economic models, to start to build some of our production models? Um, and then also really importantly, and, and I really acknowledged the question before because I thought it was really important, you know, what, what, what do you want as an organisation or a group of organisations in terms of what sits behind, what are the really key things that sit behind your story? Um, is it organic? Is it, uh, what are your ethics and so forth? But also, what, what might be your business model? There is a really good opportunity to be an ingredient supplier, a high quality ingredient supplier, but there's also a really interesting model to develop full supply chains or full value chains where you take products, develop them into nutraceutical products and actually take them to market. And if there's anyone in the room that's interested in talking about that, that's obviously in the space I'm in. And, um, but, and that doesn't necessarily be that you have to own the whole value chain. It might be that, that you partner, you collaborate with other parts of the value chain. Um, really horrifying, I've found that most of the supplements that are sold in New Zealand are not New Zealand grown ingredients. In fact, very few of them New Zealand grown ingredients. Um, so we're not even eating our own product, products. Um, and then finally, the opportunity for, for the private public partnership. So you know, there's big, big projects, MB projects, sustainable farming fund type projects that you as a region could really um, get some government support on and as well as uh, um, EWI involvement as well. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's been lovely to visit this region again. Thank you very much for bringing me up there. And um, it's just been a pleasure working on this project because it's something I'm so personally passionate about as well. Thanks.
I, th- I believe, but Lou may better back me up, was that was just around the extensiveness or the quality that the volume of the scientific data. Um, yeah. Lemme, what are your thoughts on? Thank you very much. Right, so I'd now like to invite Elise Smith to join me on stage. Elise is from a company called Envision. And um, she has a very varied background, but um, she's passionate about um, how we can make data more approachable and useful by providing decision support tools as interactive maps. Um, so I think what we've seen tonight is that there's an undeniable opportunity for medicinal um, plants here in Taranaki. Um, and that, and of, of course, we also have a very engaged group of people who have got aspirations to get this venture off the ground. So for us as uh, Venture Taranaki, and our next step was to try to understand how we could support organized collaboration. So we're very excited tonight. Oh, no. Yeah. We're very excited tonight um, to launch our medicinal plants mapping platform. So as a first phase, the information from the 30 growers that we've received, um, so which has been shared or which we hope and we're inviting you tonight to share, um, this will be plotted to identify clusters of growers to enable commercial viability. And for those who participate, you'll receive login details with, with detailed access to information. The information will also be, top line information will also be displayed on our website. So that really indicates to um, potential commercial partners or investors as to what's happening here in Taranaki in this space and gives a, um, an idea that, you know, things here really are humming. Um, as a further step, we hope to link this to a pilot framework, framework which we are um, working on. And this will ide uh, ideally generate robust data that can be replicated and it can be fed into this um, system. We're also um, looking to a platform that allows the formation of groups. Um, and this, the entry to these groups will be um, dependent on certain criteria, including contribution, but really this will depend on the ownership of the group, which we hope comes from the community. It will allow you to share information, resources and comments, discuss commercial opportunities, and take action. So we now have a brief video to show you how it could work and Elise will take us um, through it and she'll discuss it as it happens. Excuse me. Conrad, you might need to come and help me. This is a map of Taranaki. You will probably recognize the soils. Um, we use that because it's obviously integral to growing herbs or any horticultural um, crop. The map allows you to turn layers on and off so you can see various features like conservation land or municipal areas. Here at the bottom is a, is a key on the side of the map which will show you details about what uh, you're looking at. You can make it much more visual by changing the, 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 the tra um, transparency of it. So here you really can see the soils very brightly. You can go and investigate your own land. If you can just enter your um, address in the bar at the top, it will then take you to that area. And if you're looking at a soil map, for example, you can just click on that map and it will give you some indication of the soil on the right hand side of the screen. And you can have quite an interesting time going around to see how close different parcels of soil are. 
Of course, we, there's more to growing crops than just the soil. You really need to know a lot more with, whether it's how much water that crop is going to require at what time of year, if it's going to be liable for mold and disease and things at the end of the autumn. And so the number of growing days is really important. The, the actual seasonal weather is important as well as perhaps having your own rain gauge would be nice. <laughs> so here we have various um, layers which have been provided by NIWA. And it's, the intention is that we will be able to use the information from your questionnaire about what time you plant your crop or you harvest it and integrate that into some sort of viewpoint to tell you where the most suitable place for growing that crop will be. So if you have a very, very dry spring, it might not be a suitable place. So that when we start integrating all of these layers, you'll be able to find out where known growers have grown crops, what their conditions are that will inform you whether your patch of land is likely to be able to grow those crops. And we hope that that will give you a very good idea about the possibilities. We know that Taranaki grows almost anything, <laughs> but knowing that some of these herbs have got very long lifespans, might take years, it's, it's quite important to know how much frost-free days you have. This is an example of known sites. I just put these on the map as some as a crop I know. And obviously there's a lot of places in Taranaki that's the right rainfall. We put on the number of growing days. It's shrunk a bit, hasn't it? And soil types are the dark brown. So you can see that there's not that not many places overlap. But green shows you where all those factors overlap. And for this crop, those are the most suitable areas. There's a lot in South Taranaki, not just brown new plumbers. So what we need to do, we probably need to obscure the locations of growers if any of this if this becomes public. So let's just say these are the growers who are contributing. If we want to put it on a public map or anything, we can just make a heat map. A public map shows that there's a huge, <laughs> there's a huge body of people around Okato and another body of people around Stratford who have got an interest in this particular herd. <laughs> so we're near the end. I should have left it run for longer. We were sticking to a three minute rule. <laughs> I'm sorry, I think we've lost it, but. So we can, we can do some more maps like that. And the idea is that we will, we will be able to use the information that you return on your, the questionnaires about what you do with your crops and the, the facilities that you might need so that we can really start working on a collaborative process. All right, so I hope you guys are all as excited about this as we are. Um, there has just there's such wide application for it, and there's so many ways that you can connect with each other and, that you, and the information that can be shared um, in order to kind of you know to get this industry off the ground. So as a next step, uh, we invite you to participate in the mapping activity. So for everybody who has attended today or who has, is attending with us online, um, an email will be sent out to you tomorrow with a link. Um, which will, a questionnaire, um, it is quite detailed, um, but we're trying to pare it down as much as possible. And um, the participation, the, it will be open for the next 10 days. This information will then be analyzed um, and we will be developing um, maps similar to what you see here, as well as mo more robust ways of sharing in the information that has emerged. Um, those who um, have participated, will thereafter receive login details to access the detailed information. And um, there'll be opportunities to communicate with others through platforms. We've got a couple that we are investigating at the moment around the commercialization of these ventures. Um, as has been mentioned, uh, next stage, further research and pilots will be very important. Um, and these are under co um, consideration subject to resourcing. Um, but really, I'd, and I would encourage you to also reach out to us um, and to use the tools, resources, and support that are available through Venture Taranaki. Um, and we'll be releasing more information to our website in the coming months. Um, the presentations and contact details of the speakers will be added to the Venture Taranaki website tomorrow. So does anybody have any questions? 
Conrad, I think. No. Yeah. I think they comments. Does anybody have any questions? Chair? No. Okay. Well, <laughs> I hope it's been clear. Um, so, yeah, so thank you very much for coming out this evening. Um, we've appreciated your participation. We appreciate you being here this evening. Um, and really, I would like um, to welcome you all to stand up for us to close um, this evening with our Karakia Mutanga. <laughs> Koya ra e rongo, akaria a kiukiuna, kia watia, kia watia, aira kua watia, o haimari. Thank <laughs> you.